Backyard Farmer is a co-production of NET Television and the University of Nebraska-Lincoln Extension. Tonight on the season finale of Backyard Farmer, we'll see our garden through the year and have some final words to wrap up the season. That's all coming up next, right here on Backyard Farmer. Welcome to the final Backyard Farmer of the season. I'm Kim Todd and we're glad you could join us for our final hour of good gardening this season. Joining me on the panel, we have experts from the University of Nebraska Extension, Fred Baxendale, all those insect questions. I can't wait, I've got lots of them. <laughs> Rock Gaswa, all of the turf and weed questions. It's hard to be happy when it's our last show. It is very hard. <laughs> <laughs> Kevin Corris, rots and spots. Hello, hello. <laughs> and Kelly Fian in from Columbus answering all the horticulture questions. Hi, Kim. You know, as this is a taped program, we will not be able to answer your calls tonight. So instead, we're going to focus on those emails and catching up on some of those calls you've made previously. As always, if you need help with gardening questions, you can visit with your local extension educator or you can go to the Backyard Farmer website. And to get the show going, let's take a look at samples. And Fred, we're actually getting some questions from viewers about this. Yeah. Piece. So this is kind of a fun one. Uh, many of our viewers will recognize these as mud as a mud dauber nest. And it's these little mud structures that we see up in the corners uh, in, in our garages and under the underhangs and overhangs. You know, and it's, it's kind of cool because they, can, they, they, they find the mud wherever they can find it. Often it's different colors. Colors. And the wasp, and here the, uh, if we can see the, yeah, these are called, this is a common uh, mud dauber, these three right here. And, you know, they build these these mud tubes. Sometimes they're, they all, they're called organ pipe, and actually they're, they're long and narrow, like an organ pipe, and have a series of holes in them. These are the, the granular, the globular type. And if we turn it just a little bit, we can see the emergence holes. So what we know, we can tell that these have already emerged. And so this one's done. There's one cell right here. Yeah, we can see it right, right here that in fact has not emerged yet. So we might <laughs> not be punctured. fun to open up. And <laughs> what that does, the, the mud dauber provisions these with spiders that I have in, in, the, in, in, the, uh, in the vial right here. So she goes in, collects the spider, stings it, paralyzes it, and then lays an egg on it, then seals it up. Now, here's the interesting part of the story. This little blue one right here, this is called a blue mud dauber, and it actually never builds its own, uh, its own um, mud nest. It, in fact, usurps the nest of the common mud dauber. What it does, it comes in, it moistens a little opening, pulls out the spider, that's in there, dumps it, brings its own spider, lays an egg, and then seals it over. So it takes advantage of the common mud dauber's nest. So. That sounds like a lot of work for a spider meal. Yeah, well. And Fred, I put usurp on my pancakes. <laughs> <laughs> How cute. Cool. Thanks, Fred. Yep. Okay, Rock, we have a weed. Uh, we have a weed. And actually, Kim, you brought this in for me because mm -hmm. I was struggling to get a weed today. Um, not that they aren't out there. But anyway, this is leafy spurge. Now, leafy spurge is common to our ranching and conservation, prairie conservation people and stuff because it's an extremely invasive and hard to control weed. And it also, um, cattle won't feed on it, and so they deliberately stay away from it. But the reason I brought this is that you're saying, why is a turf person talking about, you know, a prairie weed or a, or a range weed? And it's because this belongs to a, a really unique family. And I think many of you all know the Euphorbia family. And you know, when you squeeze it, I don't have a good cut here, but when you squeeze it, you know, you get that white, milky sap. And not, unlike the white from a, from um, milkweed, which is not as sticky. This is sticky like a booger, so it, your hands get all sticky after you do it. And it's also in the same family as prostrate spurge, which is a weed that all the turf people hate. And then around Christmas, we, or the holiday season, excuse me, um, we get poinsettias. So they're all members of the same family, 
and they all bring this a, a sort of a unique ecological niche thing. So I thought that, you know, nature's wondrous pageantry, I one upped you with a weed. There you go. <laughs> or maybe. There's a, I think there's we have a, the a uh, latex. milky snap. Yeah. I think we have the one upsmanship with the ear like thing in front of Kevin uh, there. This is wondrous pageantry, right? Actually, this is a sample courtesy of our producer. He uh, found this on the way into work this morning. This is. Uh, a gyrodon fungus. Um, <laughs> gyrodon. So, yes, that's the genus name, and I guess that's also now the common name is gyrodon. And we know it's a gyrodon because uh, the top of the cap here is brown, and then you can see the margin is kind of wavy. And then when we turn it over, what we see is basically the absence of a stalk. There's a little, just a small little stalk there that you can see. Um, and then the the really netted, um, the netted veins underneath too is very indicative of this particular um, genus of fungi. So you'll see these pop up in the lawn, um, typically under trees. They like to grow uh, on tree roots that are um, both alive and dead. Um, the, you know, I, I think they're really neat. They can be, I guess, um, bothersome to some people and eyesore, uh, but there's really n nothing that you can do other than physical removal. Just get out there and, you know, practice your golf swing on them or something like that, or just remove them by hand. Um, <laughs> as soon as they come out, too, uh, would, is better because then they have uh, less chance of releasing those spores. So um, gyrodon is the fungus and... Fun stuff, and we have had a lot of calls about that guy this year. Mm -hmm. Okay, Kelly, one of uh, well, the beauties of the yes, late season. Yes, late it's summer. not a spider meal, it's not a booger, it's not a gyrodon, <laughs> it's, it's a flower. flower. <laughs> this is one of our summer blooming shrubs, it's caryopteris, and you can see it's these, these very light, airy, delicate. Uh, some of the common name is blue mist, um, bluebeard. Um, some people call them blue false spirea, but they're not a spirea, they're caryopteris. And they start blooming, oh, possibly late July, but typically they bloom August into September. And they are just, they're one of those shrubs that the roots are hardy to about zone five, but the shrub itself, the above ground part is only hardy to about zone seven. So it is one of our shrubs that dies back in the, in the uh, winter and then you have to cut it back every spring, but it'll grow in full sun. Um, it will tolerate part shade. It, pollinators love it. It's a great plant mm -hmm. for uh, mm -hmm. butterflies and for bumblebees. Matter of fact, I had to, I, I harvested one out of my yard and I couldn't get the bumblebee off. I guess it was just too cold and I wanted to stay there. So I had to leave that stem and prune another one. But this is Caryopteris <laughs> and just a nice summer blooming shrub. Thanks, Kelly. All right, you get a very interesting picture first, Fred. This, is, uh, this is actually a Lincoln viewer. And these sort of uh, worm-like mm -hmm. things are skeletonizing her oak leaves. She wonders what's yeah. going on with that. Yeah, th those are a thing called scarlet oak sawfly, and they're sawflies, and it's the larvae. And they're really quite common on red oak. And we'll, we'll see, the, what you see is you'll see a tree, a uh, leaf that has a, a big patch that's all been tuned away. It looks like it's diseased and often maybe uh, confused with a, a diseased leaf. But what they do, they feed on the upper surface of the leaf uh, and uh, they just skeletonize it and they feed for a little while and, and drop off. So really, it's not a, a big issue. It's a leaf here, a leaf there. I've never seen a tree that was severely infested with these. So in terms of control, I mean, they would be very easy to control with anything like seven or permethrin or any of those products but generally it's just something that you can just see up there and not really be overly concerned about all right thanks Fred rock we have uh, a turf picture from Grand Island and a turf picture I believe from Lincoln and both of them sh are showing this yellowing uh, pretty severely we're seeing that quite a bit now in the first picture that was clearly in the low spots Mm -hmm. So because it was in the low spots, that indicates water collected there. And much like you go by a cornfield when it's, you know, certain times of year, you can see that yellowing. And it's just not getting the nitrogen it needs because of, of denitrification, which commonly happens in, in a lot of the grass plants. So, so that's a low depressed area. Thank you for bringing that mountain back up. That's, that's just, that's in there. And the other, though, we're seeing that a lot all over the place. And um, there's a lot of speculation about what's actually causing it. Uh, it could be something as simply as a lo low amount of nitrogen on the lawn. It could be a new soil. If that looked like new construction to me and then you've got this high variability because usually the soil you get in your yard when you move into a new home is obviously um, not the best soil on the planet and you find two by fours and all kinds of other stuff built in there. And so that, that creates a very non, um, 
uniform environment, and so nitrogen may or may not be available, or you know the plant might be growing under this sort of adverse environment. So, and then we've had weather from from some very wet wet conditions, and then we went dry, and so this all could be happening like all together. But the one yellowing was easily explained by the low spots and denitrification, whereas the others are um, they're hard to explain. It could be any number of things. All right, and so really not a whole lot to do about it. They can it. try to mask it, thank you. They can try to mask it with a nitrogen application if they haven't already put, you know, you know, two pounds or two and a half pounds down. Then otherwise they're just wasting time and then they're gonna be mowing more this fall and whatever. So, you know, they just, you know, look, look on our website. There's a really good program mm -hmm. to follow. And if you're following that and you get that discoloration, then it may be worth sending a sample into the diagnostic clinic. However, if you're not following that and you just put one bag in in the fall and, you know, the, the lawn's a little bit thin, then maybe it's simply a nitrogen question and then you could at least at the very least mask it with that. All right, thanks, Rock. Uh, Kevin, this is this is a kind of a neat question. Uh, this is from Fort Laramie, Wyoming, mm. and it's a narrow leaf cottonwood, which is uh, you know it's related to our big old cottonwood, but mm. it's got these spots, and he's wondering what uh, what needs to be done about that, if yeah. anything. Well, it's always you know almost impossible to tell just by a picture, but uh, cottonwoods are susceptible to a fungal leaf disease called septoria leaf spot. And it looks quite a bit like the picture. You have these areas of brown necrosis that are surrounded sometimes by a yellow halo. Uh, eventually they'll coalesce into bigger, larger patches. Um, that kind of is what that looks like. So um, I'm guessing that's what it is. Uh, so this disease might not come back next year. It's all dependent on the weather in the spring. This fungus infects the tree in the spring. Uh, one of the keys to management is um, just residue management. So all those leaves that fall this fall, it's a good um, idea to get rid of them before temperatures rise and we get enough moisture in the spring because all of those dead leaves contain spores and they can basically get rain splashed up onto the tree and cause uh, infection again next spring. So um, just control of, of, of the debris will go a long ways. Um, if you can, do anything to increase the amount of exposure to sunlight and wind for that particular tree by pruning or something like that. That may also help reduce the amount of disease severity. Um, if, it's, if you get chronic uh, exposure year after year of this particular disease and it just won't go away, then you might want to consider some kind of a fungicide treatment and you can consult your local tree care professional for which AI would be best against septoria and it's probably applied in the spring to prevent infection from happening. So Kevin, I have a question based on, so it's, some people like the leaf litter underneath, right? Yes. And and it's actually, that's sort of what happens in nature and whatever, yes. so, so um, what would happen if you ran over it with a mower and, and, and ground it up like they, you know, you, you can mulch leaves back to a lawn with no problem. Right, well, um, if you introduce those leaves into the soil somehow, um, you know, then there's a lot of competition with microorganisms and you might see some of the, the pathogenic fungi, those, those numbers be reduced. But if you just mow it and leave it on the soil surface, um, I think it could help. I think it could reduce the numbers, but um, I, I think you would still want to get rid of it. All right, thanks If you have guys. a bad enough infection. Thanks. Mm -hmm. uh, Kelly, this is a viewer that had a neighbor who bought uh, plants labeled honeydew. Okay. And this is what he got. <laughs> this is in, a ba in Bassett, Nebraska. And, and he's saying it tastes a little bit like an unripe musk melon. Okay. Well, it, I mean, it, it could be a honeydew. It just may not be one of, you know, what we commonly know as honeydew with, you know, the lighter green rind and the green uh, flesh. So there's, there's a variety of melons that are called honeydew. I actually don't recognize it. I can't give you the specific name of what it is. You, uh, the person may want to go back to where they purchased it, take a picture and see, you know, what, what was the variety, um, what type of melon is it? You know, honeydew is cucumis. Milo or something like that. I think that's correct. And there are different types of honeydew besides the one we commonly see. So, you know, that if, if a viewer out there recognizes it, knows what it is, then go ahead and uh, email us and let us know. Um, but you may want to start with the retailer. Uh, a lot of people, well, must be from cross pollination, but cross pollination does not affect the current year's fruit, so that wouldn't be the case. So hopefully um, they can solve the mystery. All right, thanks, Kelly. Well, each week we take a few minutes to show you what's happening out at our backyard farmer garden. Thanks to some special equipment, we've gathered pictures taken throughout the growing season. We'd like to show you how our garden grows in the special time-lapse feature. One of the most exciting things in the backyard farmer garden this week is our gill.
Kids working this week in the Backyard Farmer Garden. We have so much fun planning, selecting, planting, and growing that garden. And of course, we have some wonderful master gardeners that help us with everything from the propagation to the mulching, the weeding, and the watering throughout the entire year. So even though the season is winding down, I know that they're thinking about doing it all over again, and so are we. Wow, that was really cool. That's fun, isn't it? All right, uh, Fred, your second picture question. This is a oh. viewer who came across, uh, in fact, it's two different viewers, two different pictures. <laughs> they came across these while they were trimming and they were everywhere. They fly about, they're about the size of a gnat. What are a they? A gnat? Yeah. Uh, th th uh, those, are, those are lace bugs and they get their name uh, because their wings are, are very lacy. Actually under a microscope, they're quite attractive. And you can sort of see them maybe a little better on that one. Um, they feed on the uh, underside of the leaves and uh, can dis discolor the leaf. You'll get some yellow discoloration. Interestingly, now they can, at this time of year, they build to extremely high numbers. I mean, literally thousands and tens of thousands of them on, uh, on any given tree uh, when they're abundant. So, and then what they do is when the wind blows, they kind of rain down. Uh, and people sometimes will think that they bite. Actually, they don't bite, but there's a little predatory bug called a minute pirate bug that does. So people feel to get a little stinging sensation when they bite. So in terms of control, uh, again, it's so late in the season that we aren't really overly worried about them. But if they show up a little earlier, you can use a whole garden hose, syringe some of them off those lower leaves, try to reduce them that way. And again, you could use something like permethrin. <coughs> Uh, eight to uh, to control them, but that's rarely necessary. Again, it's just something we put up with late in the season on things like uh, oak, sycamore, hackberry, and a variety of other uh, trees and shrubs. All right, thanks, Fred. Uh, Rock, this is a viewer who uh, is worried that this particular plant in her yard is poison oak because she got a bad case of it, and uh, she, she's wondering, is, is this poison oak? Uh, right between the sumac there, that's Venus mallow. Um, it's member of the mallow family has no um, none of the things that the poison ivy or poison oak or, oak or the true poison sumac have, and that's not poison sumac either. So um, I'm thinking she somehow got into some poison oak or poison ivy somebody somewhere else because uh, that's Venice mallow and it's an annual and relatively easy. I mean, if she doesn't, you know, she could pull it up. It looked like the the flower had or was already spent in that picture, so obviously the seeds have probably been dispersed, but she might have more or less next year, but it's because it propagates by seed. So it's not really a big deal, but that's not what caused her poison oak. All right, excellent. So she's gonna have to sleuth around a little bit. Yep. <laughs> okay, uh, Kevin, here we go again. What is <laughs> killing the impatience? Mm. Uh, she's pulled out three areas because they had no foliage and then she knows that whatever is left is going to look like the stem in the middle there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that looks a lot like uh, impatience downy mildew. Um, what you'll also see other than just the foliation is kind of a white fuzziness um, on the underside of the leaf. Um, and that's the sporulation of the fungus, the downy mildew fungus that causes this. Um, the biggest thing is to try to inspect your, your plants uh, while you're at the nursery and, and to not bring any of this home. Because um, uh, unfortunately, <laughs> <laughs> this fungus does produce um, spores that are capable of surviving in the soil. Uh, there have been some studies sh that shown that these spores can survive for relatively long periods of time. Now, these studies haven't necessarily been conducted in Nebraska, so we don't know how they can handle our winters. But it is safe to assume that once you have this disease, it might be in your landscape for a while. So you might want to mark these areas where you put um, these impatience and, and keep them out of those areas for at least one or two years if you can. Um, and it's only impatience Walleriana, I believe, that is susceptible to right. impatience downy mildew. So the other guys will work in that same location. Right, yeah, so that's unfortunate for late season loss of all that beauty. Yes. Mm -hmm. All right, Kelly, uh, we have a viewer who has hydrangeas. She, she didn't say whether they're actually the Nico Blue or Endless Summer, but her question is, if she prunes them back in November to a foot tall, mm -hmm. will they come back next spring and bloom late summer? She pr pruned them early spring last year and didn't have any flowers. Okay, well, it all depends on what type of hydrangea they are. Um, if they, 
they look like they're only about a foot tall right now. <laughs> yeah. And you know, the hydrangeas will bloom on, you know, there's some that bloom on um, this year's wood. So the wood, and then it overwinters, and then it'll bloom earlier in the spring, and then they're, and then they're like the endless summer and so on that um, bloom again on current year's wood. So I guess you, without my knowing what it is, um, she mainly needs to experiment. I, the, the fact that she pruned them in the spring, right, mm -hmm. this year, and they didn't bloom, um, you know, we've had, we had a lot of experience with that this year. It may have just been the weather that we had. I mean, the hard winter, uh, it killed that, the fact that she pruned in spring, she pruned away the wood, so I'm um, bloomed right. on. I think I would, if it were me, I would wait and see if they bloom early in the spring. Right. And then prune them after they bloom. And that's the best way to experiment with it and figure out what kind they might be. Excellent, thanks Kelly. All right, uh, mm. Fred, let's see. We have a question from Crete about whether beneficial nematodes could be used as insect control in a vegetable garden and whether that will help with squash bug and Japanese beetles. Well, let's, the, let's answer the second part. Squash bug, Japanese beetle, probably not. But it's a really interesting question because nem beneficial nematodes, again, nematodes are little t are tiny worms that uh, infect uh, insects various types of insects, they feed in there, they reproduce, and they ultimately kill the insects, release many, many more what are called in, uh, infective juveniles that infect other insects. So in principle, it, it's really a good idea. Here's the problem. When, when we spray out the, in, the uh, nematodes, the beneficial nematodes, you know, they're used to being in a, war, in a moist environment. Well, if they're sprayed on the leaves, then uh, the, the leaves, the, the leaf dry dries and the nematode dies. So delivering these nematodes in an effective way is always the challenge. So it's certainly worth a try. If I did it, I would do it in the evening or when you, just when you're getting a dew on to keep them active on those leaves and keep them moist as long as possible. You certainly don't want to do it in the morning where you have the day uh, we have the hot day coming up uh, even now. So do it in the evening and give it a try. I mean, I, I've done a lot of work with nematodes over the years and some, there are some applications that work really, really well as in turf. Excellent, thanks Fred. All right, Rock, this, um, we have talked about starting the three-in-one weed control in your turf around Labor Day. This viewer is wondering when we end that, if we're going to do the, the weed control. And then kind of the second thing is also they want to do this in the vegetable garden as well after their final harvest. Okay, so let's, let's do like Fred did. Let's do the second question first. Is, so in the vegetable garden, that would depend on the product that they buy. And some of them um, have carryover. You know, they, they can't be applied to subsequent um, edible crops. So just check the label on that. But there's no reason after you've harvested the vegetables that you couldn't go in on a warm day, you know, the vegetable bed is there, it's been turned or whatever, and spray with Roundup, which is okay. And then you'd knock those weeds, if they're perennials, dandelion or any number of perennials out there, you'd get rid of them then. And so it's okay to spray Roundup, you know, subsequently after growing the vegetables. But I'd be a little bit concerned. It's 2,4-D, can it sit in the soil a little bit longer, and, and dicamba especially, so I guess I would get away from those. Now the, the question was about, okay, you do the first one at Labor Day, and that's perfect because you know, the deciduous trees and the grapes and the tomatoes are all on their, you know, they're, they're punch, pumping all their nutrients and everything into the leaves and the leaves are no longer importing. So they don't tend to take up the herbicide as poorly. Now we don't want you spraying willy nilly and you know, I mean, you still have to be careful. You still have to use some common sense already, okay? But still, at least this time of year, you're gonna, and then the perennial weeds take it down into their root system and they're annihilated uh, relatively, um, much better than they would be with a spring application. So, um, yeah. so the second application, um, depending on products, anywhere from four to eight weeks after, and when you, and then, but you're going to get some other growth in there. So, if you've got a really weedy mess of a lawn, I would say go ahead and go to do it, go go four and four and do two applications after the Labor Day one, and then even on a warm day after, if you still see some winter annuals coming up, and you know we, we're not going to do any injury to the trees and shrubs, um, you could hit. Uh, you could hit the weeds even on, you know, 65 degrees or better on a day. The herbicide is going to be taken up, and even in the hen bed and the and the mustards and the other ones as well. The vegetable garden one, the better check the label, and I wouldn't be doing it in my vegetable garden. So all right, I go with sir. Roundup, or excuse me, glyphosate. All right, <clears throat> this is a Bellevue viewer, Kevin, who has a question about an Austrian pine. 
dropping needles from the central part of the tree and then also looking pretty nasty mm -hmm. in general. <clears throat> yeah, well, when, when a evergreen tree drops its needles from the inside, especially this time of year, um, that actually could be something called just natural needle drop, mm -hmm. especially if it's the whole tree and it's only on the inside of the tree. Um, uh, sometimes it can be the result of stress, but pine trees especially will, will do that every few years. They'll drop some of their inner needles. However, if you're seeing something um, that looks more like this sample that I have, it could be Diplodia tip blight. And as the name implies, it's a tip blight. And um, just the very tips of the needles will be affected and killed this year's needles. And all of the older needles will be green and healthy looking. So uh, Diplodia tip blight, as well as Dothostroma needle blight, are very prevalent right now um, in our, our, our pine trees. And again, um, the greatest thing to combat this particular disease is sanitation. So these particular fungi produce spores on the cones and on needles that fall to the ground. So again, sanitation, if you can remove those, that'll help reduce your disease pressure. Um, and unfortunately, we have taken several down on campus and in the surrounding neighborhoods here because of both Diplodia and Dothostroma. So these are getting to the point where you might want to consider a, a spring application of a fungicide to help combat these particular guys. All right, thank you, Kevin. Mm -hmm. Kelly, we have an awful lot of people with pin oaks that are still, or right now, really looking terrible and chlorotic and or then some brown on them. Mm -hmm. um, you know, some people think it's a little bit of drought. Others are do iron, but don't do it now because it could shock the trees. <laughs> so what do we do about treating uh, pin oaks for chlorosis right okay. now? Yeah, well, if it is iron chlorosis, uh, you know, the first check the leaf, and if it's a light pale green to yellow and the veins are still dark green, then that's the iron chlorosis, which um, is due to our high pH soils and p trees, some trees, pin, including pin oak, um, are unable to take up the iron that is in the soil. So, you know, what, what a lot of people promote is, you know, the trunk injection because you're bypassing the soil and the pH. Um, but you, you know, the trunk injection is not like us getting a shot in the arm. Um, every time you do it, it does create a wound in the tree that the tree compartmentalizes and closes off, and you know the tree then has lost that wound. So you know, doing it to a somewhat healthy tree once in a while is is not that big of an issue. But if you're treating it, you know, every you say two, three years, then eventually even just the injection could cause some issues down the road. So you kind of have to decide, <laughs> you know, the treatment or, you know, the iron chlorosis too can cause the tree to start to get pretty severely um, stressed and start having branch and twig dieback. I, you know, this time of the year, I think maybe waiting until spring, I, pin oaks can be treated for iron in the fall. Um, it, it works better on pin oaks than it does on silver maple. Um, but you may want to wait uh, if the tree's thoroughly stressed, you, I don't know, you know, it's always a tough call. If it's really, really stressed, then it's not going to, to it's not going to tolerate the injection real well either because uh, it won't close those wounds or compartmentalize those wounds and that can lead to other issues. Um, but if it's kind of on the line between really, really stressed and not too stressed, then maybe the, the injection would be uh, just the ticket. But you might want to wait until next spring because those leaves that you're going to be greening up are going to be dropping off here pretty soon anyway. All right. So it would be you. fine to wait till spring. I need to, I need to comment on mm -hmm. that because she, while, she while, while Kelly was talking, I'm going, okay, this is um, <laughs> embarrassing because I didn't even mention iron in the picture, in the turf pictures turf at all. Picture. And yeah. it could be iron chlorosis. That's, that's entirely possible, especially in construction soil. And just like Kelly said, only instead of the, the veins being netted in a, in a turf leaf or the lilies, for example, the, the veins are parallel. And so you'd have green, not green, green, not green. And, and it, it's very evident. So if they're seeing that, then it's definitely iron. And unlike the trees that, um, you know, have the, have the bark issues and the, mm -hmm. and the injury issue, turf just keeps on growing. And so you can, you can use a, a foliar spray and the garden stores have them and spray iron down. Or you can actually use a chelated form of iron that's applied and watered. And um, th that didn't look like iron to me. It looked like nitrogen, but uh, that's, Thank you, Kelly. Mm -hmm. I appreciate mm -hmm. that. All right. Excellent. Well, and you can soil treat pin oaks as well. I mean, you can do right. a soil treatment. So if you're concerned about that injection and you don't think the tree will tolerate an injection or deal with that wound by closing it off correctly, um, you know, you can, uh, there, you can apply iron to the soil as well, but that would be better done in the spring too. All right. Mm. Thanks. Maybe not. Well, heading into the fall, some of our shrubs and trees might be looking a little stressed, like that pin oak. But for the final green and growing tip of the year, Jeff Culbertson is going to show us what's happening with our early fall colors. 
A lot of times in the late summer, early fall, we'll get questions about what's going on with my tree or shrub. Part or all of it may be going dormant earlier than the other trees or shrubs in the, in the yard, and we're concerned that there may be something going on with that particular plant. Uh, for example, this pagoda dogwood here, you can see we have one little section here where we're starting to already get some of our fall color, some leaves are already starting to fall off. So what we do uh, when we have that, when we're faced with that, is we'll come in, make sure that the wood is still pliable, that branches aren't dead. So if you have a dying branch or a dead branch, obviously we want to prune that out, but we want to avoid doing any big pruning right this time of year. But you know, there could be a variety of things and some of them may really be of no concern. Based on light and everything else, sometimes trees in certain sections will just go dormant a little earlier than the others. So at this stage, don't overreact, don't worry about it and we'll see what spring brings. Thanks, Jeff. It's time to take a short break. Coming up soon, we'll hear some final words to wrap up our season and more of your questions, of course. There's more Backyard Farmer coming right after these messages. Thanks for staying with us on Backyard Farmer. Just a reminder, this is a taped program, so we're not taking your calls tonight. Kelly will be showing us the plant of the week in just a second, but right now it's time for the lightning round. Are you ready? I'm ready. All right, we have an Iowa viewer who has moss on the trunk of their red maple and the bark is falling off. Is this a former tree? I, yep, it, it'll soon be gone. <laughs> okay, <laughs> is, it, uh, is it all right to divide hostas now in the fall? Uh, yes, you can. Hostas are hard to divide. Um, spring is a, is a great time to do it as well. All right, when do you plant garlic? Fall. Fall is probably the best time to plant garlic in Nebraska, so learn more about it and plant this fall. Is it too late to plant a fall garden, especially based on temperatures and rainfall? <laughs> it depends on what you plant, but it's, it's getting pretty late for some things, so you need to look at the days to maturity, and, and if, if it stays as cold as it's been, it might be way too late. All right. When should a person prune their raspberries? It depends on the raspberry. Um, after uh, the, the summer blooming ones, you prune out the ones that bore fruit this year. Um, and the ever bearers that are bearing now, you can wait till March and then just mow them all off. All right, when, when should you take cuttings from coleus to be able to overwinter it and use it next year? Before they freeze. <laughs> okay, <laughs> nice job, good ending. All right, you ready, Kevin? Mm -hmm. So we have a viewer who has cedar apple rust mm -hmm. and knows it and wonders what they can do for next year. Is there a systemic? Uh, there is a systemic. It's usually there typically um, AI is propagonazole based. So tell yes. people what AI is. That's the your second ingredient. question. <laughs> <laughs> okay. The active ingredient. When you buy uh, something from the store to put on a tree, there's only one ingredient in there that actually does the job and the rest is just inert. All right, excellent. So is there a permanent solution to mushrooms in the turf? <sighs> Besides pavement. Yeah, yeah, pave your backyard. No, I really don't think so. I think you're just going to have to deal with them. <laughs> okay. Um, do soybean diseases affect the edible ones? Um, some, yes and no. Um, there are a lot of different kinds of soybean diseases that don't uh, affect dry bean and vice versa, but then there are a couple that do overlap, so it's kind okay. of a difficult question. So we have a viewer who has put on a fungicide four times in a single season for several years. Is that... That's a, yeah, that's a little excessive. Um, usually you put your uh, product on based on its uh, residual and what particular disease you're combating. So. Excellent, thank you. You ready, Rock? Sure. Uh, multiple questions about controlling violets and what is the product? Um, for violets, you want to use something that has triclopyr in it. It's a little bit of a, um, a bit more systemic for violets. So there's a lot of products out there. Look on the label and the active ingredient. It's triclopyr. And the timing is when? Fall. Perfect to do it right now. Should have started at Labor Day with the first step, but they still have time for a couple to get them out. And violets were very aggressive this year. Okay, so how late can uh, a lawn be aerated in the fall? Um, I generally say around mid-October. Mid okay. Can a weed and feed product be used this fall in a mixed turf, or do we just weed, or do we just feed? <laughs> I'm not sure what they understand by a mixed turf. I, I'm, my guess is it's probably Kentucky Blue with fescue. Sure. Okay. How do you control trumpet creeper? 
Um, some people move, change addresses. <laughs> and what do we put on stumps to kill them after you cut the uh, stump producer? Um, there's a couple of triclopure actually works, a product I mentioned earlier, and sometimes the poison ivy killer will work. But you, Tordon is, is an extremely effective product, but there is lateral branch transfer to other species, or excuse me, uh, root transfer. And um, if, if you've got a big, massive garden, you've done a really good job, you got roots going everywhere. So let's not, let's not use that product. Excellent. For, for that particular application. Excellent. Thank you. You ready, Fred? I'm ready. How, why do we have so many spiders and grasshoppers this year? It's, a, it's fall. <laughs> <laughs> and what are the tiny, tiny little insects that might be discovered biting people? Uh, it could be it could be a gnat, one of the uh, biting flies. Uh, it could be that minute pyro bug that we see, and they're very common uh, where there are lace bugs. All right. Minute pirate bugs. Okay, so the the follow up to that one too is how about those pimodi itch mites? How far north do they go? You know they they were up into Lincoln a few years ago, back in 2000, but we have not seen any pimodi itch mites for last five years. Okay. Would there be any such thing as a twig girdler that would clip off the ends of cedar, or would that be one of Dennis's critters? I would say it was probably the, one of the critters. I mean, there are a lot of twig girdlers that do break off them, but mostly it's in hardwood trees. All right. W what is a hoverfly? A hoverfly. It's <laughs> a hoverfly is is in the family uh, Surfidae, uh, and they and they'll fly and they'll they'll hover. It's a pre it's a uh, predator, so it's one of the good guys. Excellent. Looks a little bee-like, as I recall. Yeah, it does. Look, it looks like a bee. All right. Some of them. Okay. <laughs> Excellent. All right, Kelly, you have uh, some beauty for the I, plant of the week. I do, and and Kim brought these in rather than uh, Gladys, since we're taped tonight. But this, a uh, very pretty arrangement. These uh, black ones right here is blackberry lily. Um, and this is actually the, I guess you'd call it the fruit. Um, and the, they stay there, I mean, they're hard, they'll stay there all winter, but it's a very invasive. It's a little orange flower, speckled, um, very pretty, but be aware that it will spread on you. The purple one is pitcher sage, which is one of our native um, salvias, but pitcher sage. And I'm gonna rotate it here. Um, the tall spike here is the, and both of the yellow ones are goldenrod, but the tall spike is one that's called goldenrod, or if you've heard of the variety Wichita Falls, that's uh, that goldenrod, and then the one in the middle is just one of our natives, and I think you said it was rigid goldenrod. So a very pretty um, arrangement for fall. Tis the time of year, and those were, I, I'm sure I have soldier beetles all over my car. <laughs> oh, yeah, lots and lots of them. Yeah. <laughs> all right, uh, Fred, speaking of goldenrod, you have a picture of a caterpillar hiding its little self in the goldenrod, and, and our viewer wants to know, what is that? Well, I'm, I, I appreciate that you would send me this one, because actually I had to go to the internet to oh. try to track it down. It's not one that I had seen before. Mm -hmm. Okay, it's, so it's in the family Noctuity. It's a very large group of, of uh, moths and, and caterpillars. Uh, that feed on a huge variety of different kinds of plants. And so the, I, I tracked it down and I sort of shared it with uh, Steve Spomer, who's our lepidopterist, our butterfly moth expert at the, uh, in the department. And we think it's called uh, the asteroid moth. Okay, it's a caterpillar of the asteroid moth. And I get one of these noctuid moth, one of these noctuid uh, caterpillars. So, cool. Um, and again, up in the up in the golden rod, it's not going to cause any damage, and it may you know, kind of wonder why it's even there because typically they feed on leafy material as opposed to things like golden rod. So, so very neat. We always like to have viewers send us things. Yeah, that scratch that's, it was our heads. Very pretty caterpillar. All right, uh, Rock. This is a, a viewer from Rembrandt, Iowa, and they want to know what that weed is. Uh, Mullen. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah. That's one of our natives, right? Right. Biennial and control or letter B, letter B? Um, I think we're just going to letter B. Okay, excellent. Kevin, we have a couple of different pictures here of a couple of different things. Mm -hmm. uh, a thick off-white substance like drywall mud, what a great description, <laughs> covering what <laughs> remains of a privet. The privet didn't come through the, the winter well. They mm. pruned it to a stump. The second one here is a viewer that has, and this is one that was Omaha. This is Council Bluffs. 
something going on along the river. And this is a golden delicious apple uh, that also has a white, that white growth on its trunk. Yeah, those are uh, wood rotting fungi and they're very common here in the Midwest. Um, unfortunately, uh, when you have that on your tree, it means that that fungus was able to get into the inside of the tree and start rotting the wood or the xylem that's on the inside of the tree. So not everyone may know this, but the inside of a tree is actually dead. The cells are dead. Um, any xylem cell is no longer living. And so technically these fungi are saprophytes and not plant pathogens because they're only eating the dead material. So your tree will actually continue to function in, in, unless of course it's just a stump. But if you have this on a live tree, you might not see any dieback in the canopy. The tree might look relatively healthy, but what, what's happening is that the structural stability of that tree is being compromised. So if it's a very large tree hanging over your house or where your kids play or something like that, you want to may think you want to think about um, you know maybe removing that tree so it doesn't come down in a storm or something like that. But they're wood rotting fungi. It's hard to tell what exact species or genus just from a photo, but um, very common and, and really not much to do. Not much to do. There's there's no um, systemic or anything like that that I know of that can be applied that'll that'll help you know get rid of these guys. All right. Thank you, Kevin. Uh, Kelly, this is a viewer in Spirit Lake, Iowa, mm -hmm. and they have a yucca, and they uh, they actually want to move it. They want to know how to move it and when. Okay, well, yucca is one of those plants where um, you can move them, and in, in probably spring it could be done this fall as well. They're a tough plant, and they have a they have a tap root. They put down a really deep tap root, so they can be hard to dig and transplant. Um, and don't be surprised if if the yucca comes back where you dug it <laughs> because a lot of times they'll regenerate from that tap root. So um, I would go ahead and probably wait till spring. That'd be the ideal time. The other thing you can do is sometimes it, it sounds like they don't want it there. Uh, good luck in getting rid of it. But um, sometimes the yuccas have little side shoots. I think we call them pups, for example, would be an example or an offset. And you can take one of those as well and try to transplant it. And you can do that in the spring. All right. Thank you, Kelly. Well, it's time to take a look back. And on a day that we remember the horrible events that took place 13 years ago, we think it's appropriate to also look at the things that are good and peaceful in our lives. Our homes, our families, our friends, and of course, our gardens. Backyard Farmer this year was oh beautiful and we had a beautiful season to prove that we were right on track. We started talking about the pollinators and the role they play in the garden and in the landscape and for the health and well-being of everybody that watches our show and enjoys it. Oh beautiful means different things to different people. It is things that sing to the heart, everything from food to flowers to friends, family and pets. For 62 years, the Backyard Farmer panel has been answering all of your gardening questions. Whether it's what to put in your containers for that perfect combination of color and pop, and the ability to attract those pollinators to your landscape, or how to manage your turf. Are you converting to buffalo grass? Do you have all sorts of weeds that you're trying to control in a responsible way? This was one of those seasons in Nebraska, pretty much like any other, which meant that we had everything environmental from a whammy standpoint. Whether it was flooding or hail or the kinds of rains that were absolutely wonderful and yet we ended up with way too much in some locations. Those sorts of events generate all sorts of questions from you for our panel. We try to give you the answers on the rots and the spots, on the, the responsible use of chemicals, how to actually choose, select, harvest, and then enjoy all of the things that really speak to your heart in the landscape.
as I'm standing here in this beautiful public space with the University of Nebraska in the background, I'm reminded that UNL Extension is the reason that Backyard Farmer exists. Without Extension, our partners at NET, our volunteers, and of course all of you, our loyal viewers, we wouldn't have any questions to answer. No questions, no show. So thank you for sending those in. Thank you for letting us have all sorts of fun as we try to give you random weird answers to things that really are pretty important in your lives. Even though the gardening season has not yet ended, unfortunately our show has for the year, that doesn't really matter. We are looking forward to next year's season on Backyard Farmer. We do get so much joy and pleasure from hearing from each of you every week, and it's our hope that we can help you enjoy those lovely things that come out of your home garden and your landscape. All right, Fred, lovely things. This is actually a plant with insects that came all the way from Dallas, Texas to wow. a dorm room in Kansas City. Uh, the viewer's from Omaha, so, but the question is, should there be insects in the center of that rose? What are they and how do you get rid of them? Oh, in the center of the rose. Yeah, um, in the middle. You know, th there's, a, there, there's a rose chafer, but that's a fairly large, kind of a, a tan-colored beetle that might be in there. Certainly in the image that we just saw, I couldn't see anything in there. You know, if there's small ends, we get a lot of aphids, and there's winged aphids that might be uh, on the rose. But, you know, from that image, I can't really say much. Okay, so take it out and hose it off. Yeah, yeah. You know, tap, <laughs> tap it out into some soapy water. There you go. All right, Rock, this is a viewer who has plugged their buffalo grass, and uh, it's beginning to mm -hmm. kind of tiller out a little bit, but what, what advice do you have for the health of it going into the winter? This is a Lincoln viewer. Uh, going into the winter now, you know, the days have already gotten shorter, and, and um, it, it, you know, the, the warm season grasses kind of senesce a little bit. There's not really a whole lot they can do now, um, but what they can do is next spring, um, you know, probably about around May, get their May, June, get their first application of nitrogen down, and then a second. We don't want to over fertilize buffalo grass once established, but they can do themselves a big favor because they, they want to get it to spread, is, is to get some nitrogen on it. And the other thing is, is that we promote buffalo grass as not requiring a lot of mowing. That said, if you mow aggressively, and by aggressively I mean once a week like, you, like people do with their bluegrass, in the first year, it gets a lot thicker, and then once it establishes a real dense canopy, then it does really well. And if that's, that look, looks like that site might be prone to weeds, they may want to consider a pre-emergence and let's say want to hand weed in, in the spring as well. But it, it was actually doing really well, and they'll be amazed because every one of those little nodes along that, that runner that's running along the surface is going to pop up the same thing that that plug was. Maybe not quite as robust, so they, they, they just got to be patient. And once, once you get that buffalo grass established, most people um, with minor exceptions, very minor exceptions, love it. All right, excellent, thank you, Rock. Uh, another tree with white stuff, Kevin. This mm -hmm. is a Linwood, Nebraska viewer. It's a cherry. Mm -hmm. uh, she thinks it's a canker on the trunk. What is that? I think it's the same thing, actually. I think it's another wood rotter. Um, so I'm glad we got another picture because I forgot to mention um, that, <coughs> excuse me, a lot of times these trees are inf infected with these wood rotting fungi from wound sites. So I guess a management strategy would be to try to minimize the amount of wound sites that you, you know, deliver to the trunk of a tree with the mower or, or whatever. Um, so again, that tree is probably still going to produce. It's probably got a full canopy. Um, but again, it, you know, it's possible that in, in several years it might blow over from the wind or something like that because of the structural integrity. It's also a cherry in Nebraska. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay, Kelly, uh, we had a viewer who has white spots in their tomato flesh. This is a Magnolia, Iowa viewer. Mm -hmm. and, the, and they're wondering, can we actually identify? It's a little hard to see because of the light mm -hmm. shining, right. but there's, uh, you know, when they open the tomato up, mm -hmm. you maybe you, get a little better view Yeah, you view can see the white that. right underneath. Well, there's, a, I, I'll answer this, and then um, I might throw it over to, to Fred for a little bit if there's time, but the white, if you get hard white spots in a tomato, then that can be due to a lack of potassium in the tomato. It might be a lack of potassium in the soil, but that would be very rare probably in our area. So more often it's, uh, this year would probably the overly wet soils, all the rain that we've had, um, the roots aren't as functioning maybe as well as they could so they don't take up the potassium. 
So um, sometimes our high pH soil again will, will cause that problem. Um, typically you do not want to apply a potass any potassium without taking a soil test because too much potassium can cause problems as well, it can prevent the uptake of calcium and so on. So uh, it could just be weather related. Uh, they, they are edible. You can go ahead and eat them and hopefully some varieties are more prone to it, so you might want to keep track of the variety this year and maybe stay away from it next year. All right, thank you, Kelly. Well, our last show of the season still has a couple of announcements for our viewing audience. The first one being the Rose Society Annual Rose Show coming up this weekend, Ald Recreation Center, uh, and we have a number on the screen for people who want to know more about that. And our second one is the Specialty Crops Farm Tour on the 15th at Wolf Farms in Norfolk. And again, we have a number on the screen on that one. So a couple things to do this weekend uh, since that darn football game is at 9.30 at night. Ooh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, uh, Fred, we have a, uh, a follow-up question actually. C you know, if you wanna talk a little bit about the other option for the white stuff in the tomato. Right, so uh, stink bugs will often feed on tomatoes, particularly during dry periods, which isn't the case, but and when they do, they, they leave a, a little dot at their, where they insert their mouth parts, and then there's a little hardened area that is white or green. Uh, so the other, another option would be that it's, uh, it might have been some stink bug feeding causing that, so, All right. or a combination of both. All right. Uh, Rock, quickly, we have a viewer who says that they're getting ready to release Roundup Ready Kentucky Bluegrass. Not true. Not true. Well, that was a lightning. Okay, I better get ready for the next question. Kevin, also very quickly, uh, we have a viewer in Emerson that sent us a picture of a little fungus that looked like a little tiny white quarter, and it was looked like a, a white sea urchin. Oh, spiny. Spiny, uh -huh. that's a type of puffball. If it's really spiny and small and white, it's called the beautiful puffball. Um, <laughs> and again, um, not particularly edible, but uh, it's not causing any harm. It looks really neat, so enjoy it. All right, uh, Kelly, I think you get maybe one <laughs> question or close before we go to close here, and that would be cutting back lilies in the fall that are the, they're calling them the bush type that we mm -hmm. see in the landscape. Um, they're usually, do you let them yellow? Okay. What do we do with mm -hmm. those? Yeah, well, wait till they naturally yellow in, and, and maybe the first frost. Um, so it could be day, whether they're day lily or whether they're one of the Asiatic oriental li lilies, the answer is the same. Um, let the, as long as they're green, let them continue to photosynthesize, put more stored food in the roots for next year's blooming. Um, and then once they die down naturally or freeze, then go ahead and cut them back. Okay, all right, thanks Kelly. Well, we do want to say thank you to everybody who called in, emailed, sent us a picture or a letter this year, or caught us in the grocery store. <laughs> Without our local audience, we really wouldn't have very much to do. So we also want to say thanks to the panelists who come in every single week to answer your questions. Pretty dedicated to do that. We also want to say thanks, of course, to the production staff and everybody behind the scenes at NET. They're truly our partners in bringing you Backyard Farmer each week. Those volunteers, the master gardeners, staff at Finkies who help you answer the questions. We couldn't do the show without you either. And of course, our producer. Don't forget, the Backyard Farmer Winter Program will come to you starting in January, right in here on NET1. So be on the lookout for that one. Thanks for watching. Good night. Good gardening. We'll see you all next season, right here on Backyard Farmer. <laughs>